attention and uh, we will begin the talk on extended Swadesh list version 1.3. Uh, I represent Purdue University. I teach computer and information technology there. And let me begin with the epigraphs. Uh, words are useless, especially sentences, attributed probably best to Bjork. And another one that matters uh, probably even more, uh, randomness is a beast and you fight it with volume. Uh, this is a quote by Ed Schroeder, uh, the author of two prominent uh, chess engines, Rebel and Prodeo, uh, who experienced firsthand uh, how many games you have to test the chess engine with to get a, a good stats on its relative strength, strength to other chess engines. And what is displayed here is one of the many uh, renditions of uh, the legendary Tower of Babel. Uh, and the uh, introduction here is more from slides for the students, so most of this can be skipped except uh, for the idea that this belongs to the subfield within natural language processing that is known as comparative historical linguistics. And we are studying how the languages are related and uh, there are people within the field uh, that try to reconstruct proto-languages, arrange existing languages in groups of related languages. And naturally one uh, question that comes to mind is can computers help comparative linguists in their work and um, a few of them actually worked on that and found out that yes they can we just have to be careful what we're doing. Uh, the inspirations for this particular study are Nate Silver, I don't think there's a need to tell you what this guy has done and Graham Banks, who you might not know, but he is one of the founders of the prominent uh, rating of chess engines, CCRL, and there we have uh, chess engines rated based on statistics of thousands of uh, games that they play against each other to figure out how relatively strong those different heuristics that play chess are. How does that relate to linguistics? It does in the field of lexical statistics and glottochronology. Um, there will be no glottochronology here done per se, uh, but lexical statistics attempts to classify the languages based on counting pairs of so-called cognates, which are words that have a common origin. And this approach was pioneered by Morris Swadesh, a famous American linguist of Jewish origin and that's whom Swadesh lists are named after. They list many basic meanings of the language, and the most popular currently used list contains of 207 meanings, and it was obtained by combining the original 100 word and 200 word lists designed by Swadesh himself. There were some intersections there, and that's why we have 207 words in the 207 meaning list. Notice that the original Swadesh list is English centric in the sense that Swadesh picked the meanings that could be expressed with one and hopefully only one English word and we will try to uh, step away from being English centric. Uh, this is just a, a sampling of the 207 meaning Swadesh list obtained from Wiktionary. As a matter of fact, uh, I separate thou from you in the subsequent uh, processing, which is really no big deal because that makes it 208 instead of 207. Uh, so there are meanings there, the corresponding ones from English, French, and German, which is an interesting triangle because English is a Germanic language contaminated with uh, some French. And so there's a triangle there that determines, okay, is our English um, currently closer uh, to German than to French? Actually it is, but there's some, uh, even on the Swadesh list there's a word mountain that's adopted, uh, borrowed from French. The objective of the study ultimately is to find out, okay, do languages actually uh, diverge or continue to diverge, that is to say, um, most comparative linguists agreed, like in this picture of fireworks, that we ha are dealing with clusters of related languages. Uh, there is no way to deny that. And at some point, 
uh, they diverged from one or more proto-languages, th thus the reference to the legend of the Tower of Babel. And the approach uh, is to take the languages that are well documented, such as Coptic, uh, a, uh, s sorry, such as Middle Egyptian, uh, Ancient Hebrew, Ancient Greek, Latin, Sanskrit, uh, old, old Church, Slavonic, Old English, and such, and look at their either direct, uh, uh, direct derivatives, such as, uh, for instance, it looks like Bulgarian would be the best choice for Old Church Slavonic. It's based on prior studies. It looks like either Spanish or Italian would be the best choice uh, for the language that came originated from Latin. French is further away from Latin than Spanish or Italian, or you know, Romanian also is further away. Uh, standard Hindi has an interesting quirk that there were some words that were from Farsi that were uh, taken into such languages as Urdu, and then, then uh, since Sanskrit was documented, uh, some, uh, some words were returned into standard Hindi as st Hindi was being standardized which makes it closer to Sanskrit than it would have otherwise been. However, as far as the word stability is concerned, it's okay with me because that's one way for a word to survive, be documented and then be returned into its uh, predecessor language. Um, we could take, in some case, a quote-unquote nephew language such as modern standard Arabic as a counterpart to ancient Hebrew and uh, do the following thing, compare those languages pairwise and to their ancestors and uh, compare their ancestors pairwise to see what the shape of the resulting uh, Tower of Babel would be. Is it diverging like these fireworks or is it actually converging as borrowings appear across the modern languages and uh, make them closer than their ancient uh, ancestors, maybe. And it's unlikely that it's uh, slanted in one direction, so I don't think that would happen. So either uh, the Tower of Babel grows that way, or it grows this way, or in a strange quirk, it would grow uh, vertically, and they would stay at the same uh, distance from each other after they diverged initially. And we don't know the answer to that, uh, the natural question being, well, hasn't it been done before? Uh, not exactly. Uh, there is a classical publication by Robert Lees from 1953 on the basis of glottochronology, which reports cognate percentages for 13 such language pairs, some of which I just listed, and uh, like Old English and Modern English, Middle Egyptian versus Coptic, Classic Latin versus Modern Tuscan, which is, I suppose, close uh, somewhat to modern Italian, uh, ancient classical Chinese to modern Mandarin, and uh, I spoke to colleagues here about the interesting varieties of Chinese, uh, and uh, he used, however, Swadesh lists that contained 200 to 214 meanings, not even the same number of meanings for the same pairs, uh, but considering the modern methods where we had uh, many thousands of people polled to enable Nate Silver predict correctly uh, the results of presidential elections for first for 49 out of 50 states and then 50 out of 50 next time, or how many thousands of games now uh, chess engines play with each other to get uh, good ratings of their strength, uh, why would we just stay at 200 to 214 meetings? Uh, what would we do with the words that represent those meanings is another thing, and that's approximate string matching with uh, some interesting variations to that that we would get to next. Uh, there would be some, the tradition is, comes from Damerot and Levenstein uh, and was used initially for uh, correction of typos, uh, so, uh, all right, spell checking, and uh, they would um, uh, check into basic operations such as insertion, deletion, and substitution that would allow to transform one word into another, as in this example taken from the textbook, uh, transforming the German apple into an English apple. Interestingly, not using transposition, which Damerot did, 
where if we use transposition, we could uh, transpose E and L at the end and get a better distance uh, from Apfel to Apple. Distance being a function that has certain properties. So this is for the students. I'm sure everybody here has uh, either a formal or good intuitive notion of what a distance should be. Uh, Levenstein distances are well known. They were introduced back in 1965. Uh, Levenstein distance one allows insertions, deletions, and substitutions. No transpositions, like I pointed out. Distance two uh, doesn't even take substitutions, so for that, to do it substitution, you have to do a deletion, then you do an insertion. Uh, the Wagner-Fisher algorithm is a classic that's, again, found in textbooks. There's an example here. There was, in fact, another talk earlier in the same conference that also gave a, a dif different example of how the Wagner-Fisher algorithm would compute Levenstein distances. In this case, it computes Levenstein distance one. What we do with a set of words, however, okay, for an individual word, we know how to compute the Levenstein distance. What we will do if we have a set of 200 or maybe more words uh, corresponding to meanings in the Swadesh list. Well, then, let's notice that the word length impact uh, is significant here. If we, in language one uh, to language two, have some short words such as a versus e, ba versus c, co versus C, and so on. Uh, it looks like uh, um, uh, we'd not get a, uh, we'd good, uh, we would get a short distance because the words are short. When we take the longer words that are off and off, bob and bop, uh, sig and sick, here and kia, uh, we would get larger distances because the words are long, even though actually the words are more alike than the previous ones. Uh, that trouble can be removed though, uh, yes? Okay, uh, by normalizing this uh, by the sum of maximum lengths of the two words involved in comparison for Levenstein distance one, and sum of all lengths uh, of the words involved in the comparison for Levenstein distance two. The reason why we normalize by different things by different distances is because in one case we have uh, substitutions, in the other case we don't. Uh, the code for that is available on my GitHub that I created for that, and it's called, the project is called Wagner Fisher Swadesh. You can get that code. It's actually pretty easy. Uh, there are some remaining problems even under this approach, and we'll get to them soon. One is with translators false friends, if the meaning changed a little bit, like for the English two versus Russian do, uh, the cognates are there, but the meaning changed. Uh, it's actually closer to do uh, in do and some other Slavic languages than in Russian to the English meaning of two. Uh, then how do we weigh the difference in meanings versus a Levenstein distance that we can mathematically compute no problem between the spellings of the corresponding words. Let me leave that open, show you a funny picture from a paper by Pagel and others from 2007 that shows a tree of Indo-European languages. Uh, I inserted a smiley where instead of Slavic it says Islamic. Uh, that's a typo there in a respective uh, a journal, I think, in science. Uh, the, the trees can be built like that, and so here we have a sample tree from that same paper uh, showing a group of uh, Slavic languages, Baltic languages nearby, uh, Scandinavian languages, Rom Ro Roman languages, uh, Germanic languages, and so on and so forth. Uh, so yes, languages can be arranged in trees. There are mathematical methods that are well known for doing that, such as minimum uh, uh, length spanning tree, uh, maximum likelihood tree, and so on. It's similar to the methods that are applied in uh, genomics to create trees of how the, uh, how the organisms evolved, and that's not dissimilar to how languages evolved. Uh, other studies were published where uh, the trees built from language similarity uh, were 
compared against the uh, genetic studies and mostly the genetic trees of how the people evolved genetically uh, match their language groups with some notable exceptions here where there are some mismatches uh, like with Dravidian uh, language which is uh, away from Indo-European and is spoken mostly in southern India. It turned out when they analyzed genetically the southeast Indian population, uh, they find more closeness to the rest of India than they find between the Indo-European languages such as uh, Hindi and Urdu and whatnot that the population speaks there as compared to Dravidian languages. So that's unusual. Another good example of that is Hungarian, where they do a genetic analysis on Hungarians. Turned out they're closest to the neighboring Slavic people. However, the language of Hungarians is closest to the Finnish and Udmurtian languages spoken in Scandinavia and the Urals. Uh, there is a theory of nostratic languages that groups languages in several uh, families. This was developed by Ilyich Svitich. And uh, the map here shows how these nostratic languages uh, would be distributed according to this theory across the old world. And let's observe, though, that the languages are written using different alphabets and different other systems of writing, such as Chinese hieroglyphics. And we should think, OK, if the language is written in a different alphabet, that doesn't immediately make it all that different from a neighbor's language. We should switch to some other approach, such as using phonemes, uh, which are units of sound, like, OK, if it's, di if it's written differently, then does it sound differently? Uh, the approach here is originated with Baudouin de Courtenay, a prominent Polish and Russian linguist. Uh, and uh, there are two popular phonetic alphabets for writing uh, things using uh, phonemes, IPA and APA. And one is more popular in the United States, another one is more popular in Europe. And Milke, uh, from Ohio State, now he is at North Carolina, made an important step here to propose a phoneme similarity matrix, which would mean a set of weights assigned to transitions from one phoneme to another, so that if we're doing a deletion or insertion of some phoneme or a substitution of one phoneme for another, we would not uniformly assign one to the cost of doing that. Maybe it's less costly to replace with er, or less costly to replace p with f than some other replacement. Uh, it should be not very costly to replace m with b if uh, we have uh, stuffy nose. Um, so uh, this is a, a next step to extend the approach with Levenstein distances. And people study that, for instance, Greg Kondrak from the University of Alberta published uh, papers along cognate identification using such phonetic similarity. So again, not new, but there are also interesting problems with phonetics. Uh, with phonetics of the ancient languages that we just mentioned, such as ancient Egyptian or ancient Hebrew or even Sanskrit, they may sometimes be difficult to determine exactly, or even Latin for that matter, because the languages are quote unquote dead. We just don't have uh, any surviving native speakers of Middle Egyptian or uh, you know, Latin or whatever, ancient Greek. Uh, then we really have no choice. We'll end up using modern reconstructions of ancient phonetic systems, and we recognize the danger, but we really don't have a choice as far as I can see. Another question is how we should treat synonyms if we have different words with identical or similar meanings. Um, and uh, that I think I will uh, postpone any discussion of and move on because uh, I have a short talk. But the uh, slides are available. Uh, and uh, OK, one possible solution instead of phonemes, use something like the SAJP code proposed by Holman and others. And they devised the code that would allow to enter the data for Swadesh lists 
using uh, the uh, QWERTY keyboard only and uh, restricted it to 34 consonant symbols and only seven symbols for vowels. Uh, I wish they continued to distinguish between E and U, for example, they don't. Um, but anyways, uh, that's the idea though, it's a good idea because with phonemes, they're good for capturing differences between uh, uh, dialects. Um, okay. Uh, so let's uh, uh, quickly explain. Uh, basically, we said that for statistical purposes to get a representative statistical samples, we want to extend the Swadesh list and then let me skip a few par parts of how we would Oh no, I wanted to talk about cats. No, no time to talk about cats. Uh, let me just show this graph how the Levenstein distance is stabilized in an extended Swadesh list extended to 620 plus meanings uh, from, uh, the me uh, from 100 or 200 meanings. Uh, that's the main point behind extending this Swadesh list is that this Levenstein distances will stabilize and that may matter when the differences between distances are at stake. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, do we have any time for questions? No. Okay, then you are welcome to ask me questions afterwards. Uh, thank you very much for this forum's hospitality. And uh, let's, uh, uh, the slides are available, like I said. Uh, thank you very much and have a great day.